So hi everyone, my name is Stephen McIntosh. I'm the host of the AI Pioneers podcast. And today I'm joined by Guy Kirkwood, Chief Evangelist of UiPath. Uh, Guy, we're delighted to have you as our guest today. Uh, the whole um, purpose for this Pioneer series is to get behind both the technology, the innovation, but also the people who've kind of made these stories come to life. So Guy, please uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Uh, my name is Guy Kirkwood. I'm the Chief Evangelist with uh, UiPath. Uh, so, job. It's, the, uh, it's the best job and the worst job title in the world. We can explain <laughs> why in a minute. So, so Guy, for anyone who doesn't know about UiPath, which I'm sure is not many people, especially in our audience, but also for anyone who doesn't know what a Chief Evangelist is, please tell us, what, what, what's UiPath? What's a Chief Evangelist? Okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, so UiPath is, uh, it, fundamental aim is to reshape how people work. And that sounds like, like a very spectacular uh, thing to aim for. But the, way, the reason that we're able to say it and, and indeed um, help to do it is that um, our platform, which is Robotic Process Automation, or you might know it as RPA, um, takes away the boring, repetitive, mundane work that uh, workers um, have to endure, particularly office workers. Uh, and our uh, software robots, not hardware robots, our software robots um, actually take on that work, which elevates uh, us to and allows the humans to work on stuff that they want to and stuff that is that just makes more sense to you and me as humans. You know, it's more innovation, more ingenuity, rather than the boring mundane stuff that you have to do as part of your job. And the role itself as, uh, as chief evangelist, um, uh, I, I'm not the first, um, I, I was the first in the market, but uh, in the RPA market, but actually uh, the, the role came out of um, uh, uh, Apple. Uh, it was run by a guy called um, uh, Guy Kawasaki, another guy, funnily enough. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and Guy Kawasaki was asked by um, Steve Jobs to um, find out ways that they could sell Apple to everybody. And um, Kawasaki said that um, you, that wasn't possible because you know we're not going to sell we're not going to sell Apple Kit to uh, to DOS users uh, back then and uh, mm -hmm. MS DOS users and uh, and Windows users because uh, in his words they're zealots and you can't sell to zealots okay. you can't change zealots minds. However, what we can do, he said, is we can sell to the agnostics. And so that's uh, in in the RPA market because I started relatively early uh, in the market. Um, we've really had to create the category the category is is a is a group of organizations or a group of technologies that come together that organizations then talk about so the analyst community and the press and all the rest of it talk about rpa as a category and as a category it's actually grown uh, incredibly quickly it's the fastest growing still the fastest growing uh, enterprise software uh, category yeah. uh, at the moment and so in your kind of day-to-day -day role as an evangelist could you Talk us through, like, what, what, what kind of does it involve for you? What's your kind of uh, operating model during the week, during the quarters? Like, what's yeah. your kind of responsibility so, for the company? So the, the, the thing about being an evangelist is it's is bi-directional. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as well as doing what I do now, talking to, to our, you know, our partners, our technology mm -hmm. partners, our implementation partners, I also yep. can talk, of course, to our customers um, and to the analyst community. So that's the Gartners and Foresters and IDCs and, and, and Everest of this world. Um, and so I'm telling the story. I, I'm a storyteller. That's what evangelists do. Um, but also, I spend more time listening than I do talking. Mm. So I know that's hard to believe sometimes, but uh, I do spend more time listening. So by listening to what other people are saying uh, and what they're seeing in the market and what they're anticipating and what they want, I can then go back into the organization, into our product team, into our sales and marketing team, partner teams, and so on, so that we can adapt, so that we can stay ahead of the market. And that's worked out quite well uh, for mm -hmm. us. Um, and uh, but that you know, I said that it's the best job and the worst job title. It's the best job because I get to talk to a lot of uh, and listen to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I have to say, for the last year, I've been locked down like most of the rest of the world, and uh, and so I do miss you know the 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 physical interaction that I get with uh, with people. Sure. Um, but uh, but nevertheless, I'm, I'm now used to talking to cameras all the time uh, or you know listening to people on speakers. Um, but the, the bad thing about being chief evangelist is that I still have an inordinate number of people on LinkedIn 
um, who say um, that they are so pleased that Jesus has entered my life. And I have to explain, I'm not that type of <laughs> But you are evangelical about RPA, that's for sure. I am, um, yeah. So in terms of, I think, you know, just for everyone's benefit, I think, um, you know, the, the acronym RPA is such an incredibly powerful marketing construct. You know, the fact that it kind of personifies this, this, this work that takes place by software and kind of has this construct, which is the robotic um, worker, robotic process automation. I think it's, uh, it's definitely something that multiple stories can be laid on top of. And I think that's really one of the most um, interesting observations I've certainly got about the RPA market is just how effective that construct's been and the stories you can weave yeah, into it for transformation. You know, that mm -hmm. was all to do with uh, two people. Uh, one yep. was Phil First of uh, HFS yep. um, and um, uh, Pat Geary uh, of Blue Prism. They came yep. up with the acronym for RPA. Um, now there are, you know, there are quite a few people out, out there at the moment saying, well, it's not, you know, it doesn't contain robots. And in fact, mm -hmm. at the start involved processes, it was more to task oriented. Yeah. Um, but actually, you know, RPA stuck. So, uh, yeah. uh, but we, you know, as an organization, we look at, uh, and what, what's happening with the market is that, that the product companies are turning into platform companies mm. and you can think about UiPath as a, as, a, as a platform of platforms you know it, yep. it, it facilitates the, the 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 software robots to work both horizontally and mm -hmm. vertically so you know in breadth and depth and the, the only reason that we're able to do that is because we're including a lot of those sort of AI type uh, tools um, artificial intelligence type, uh, tools uh, mm -hmm. to enable that to happen and so that mm -hmm. by creating a platform as opposed to a product, then that, that facilitates that without any, uh, without any doubt. Well, we'll get on to the, uh, the kind of platform um, yeah. conversation a bit later, and especially about, you know, these kind of newer parts to the, to the kind of expanding intelligent automation ecosystem, including machine learning and process mining and all that good stuff. And I think also a bit more about, you know, UiPath. UiPath, obviously, uh, according to kind of recent um, publications, is, you know, a highly valued business. I know we can't talk too much about it today, but I think, you know, the most recent press that was publicly announced was that it's around a, a $35 billion valuation, which is incredible. But before we get again too stuck in the details of the company, this time around, I want to start with you. So um, tell us a bit about yourself, Guy. Like, who is Guy Kirkwood? How did you get started in this industry? How did you get started with UiPath? What's your background? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I was interviewed uh, about three, four months ago by a journalist. And, um, and he said, so take me through your career. Uh, mm -hmm. And I laughed at him because I haven't had a career. <laughs> what I've had is a collection of jobs. And, um, and every one of those jobs has really led up to where I am today, what I'm doing today. Yeah. Um, and that is not planned. It's just luck. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's that famous saying that, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you become. Um, and I try and be lazy, but um, it's quite difficult <laughs> now. Um, but the, you know, so to run through, to answer your question, yeah. um, I've done a couple of degrees um, and uh, during my master's, I did psychology is my first degree. Second degree was, in, uh, was a master's in philosophy actually, but I was working at publishing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, helped uh, working with a, uh, a, a new startup uh, in the technology space in computer-based training. So, um, uh, and bear in mind, I'll tell you how old I am. The first lesson in our computer-based training uh, program was how to use a mouse. Okay. That I really am that old. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, we, uh, I was looking at the way the brain assimilates information in my first degree. Mm -hmm. The university was quite interested in, in that. So they said, well, we'll sponsor you through to do the, the master's course. Um, and uh, you can work for this startup that we're, we're creating. Um, and we can utilize the, the working and you can do your dissertation on the, uh, on, on the results. And it took me about 30 seconds to say yes to that. And, um, uh, and uh, I had in my mind the fact that people do not learn linearly. Um, so, you know, you'll learn this bit over here and then go and learn that bit over there and then this bit over here. And then providing you check it is a very effective way of, work, of, of learning. Um, sure. But I couldn't find a piece of software that would actually do this, that we could build the platform on. Until I came across a small, uh, no, I went to university in Scotland, came across a smaller uh, uh, organization in Edinburgh called OWL, as in Twitwoo OWL. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Um, no one's ever heard of that organization, except one of the directors um, of that company was uh, someone called Tim Berners-Lee. And, um, uh, and we actually, in our little company, used the precursor of HTML to actually build our platform, uh, which is pretty cool. Mm. And, uh, and our, we, we sold um, a very large deal to, a, uh, to an insurance company. And um, uh, in typical you know, Ronson style, they, they liked it so much they bought the business. Um, which was nice. So then went into publishing. Um, so I, I went into a, a magazine publisher um, and uh, was production editor for a, um, the Scottish Licensed Trade Guardian, which is uh, which meant I had to go around an awful lot of pubs and distilleries and uh, and hotels. It was it was awful. It was it was a really bad job. No, <laughs> uh, and uh, and then um, and then for some unknown reason I decided to join the army. Um, I don't. I hadn't done OTC, officer training course at uh, core at, uh, at university, but I, I joined the TA, uh, territorial army, and um, uh, and so uh, I then decided to join them full time and um, uh, went down Scott's, to the Scott Scards, wasn't it that you joined? Yeah, you? yeah. Well, I went down yeah. to the regular commissions board, uh, which is the mm-hmm. where you know because I was old uh, and fat yeah. at that time as well, <laughs> and. Um, uh, I went down to the regular commissions board in Westbury, which is where they're going to ask you whether you're going to be, you know, or test whether you're going to be an officer material. Yeah. Um, and did okay on the, on the mental stuff, but appallingly badly on all of the, uh, all of the, the physical stuff. And, uh, and it came to the interview and they said, so, uh, Mr. Kirkwood, how long have you wanted to join the army? I said, about two weeks, um, which was true, but not necessarily the answer they were looking for. So they sat me on something called Row Allen Company. Um, so uh, anyone that's uh, that's been through Santos will will know um, uh, and, and will be quietly sobbing to themselves uh, about Row Allen Company because basically it's for seventeen-year-old schoolboys where they're not sure they're off some material, so they just basically spend three months um, abusing them, um, you know, getting them to run around morning, noon, and night, and um, you go on camping trips in the pouring rain in Wales, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so, uh, because they just assumed as the twenty-five-year-old fat boy um, that I was going to be uh, that I would leave. Anyway, I didn't. So, uh, anyway, I ended up in the um, in Scots Guards, as you say. So, you know, everything from sort of running around Belfast, getting shot at, to um, uh, to ser- you know, ceremony of the keys and changing guard at the Buckingham Palace and that sort of stuff. So it was a great time. So, okay. very four very happy years in the army, uh, operational and uh, and public duties, mm-hmm. um, and then. Um, I had lined up a job with Warburgs, uh, SG Warburgs, and um, uh, it was an investment bank um, mm-hmm. to look at tech stocks. I mean, the plan was for me to go and become a, a, a sort of trainee fund manager, basically, because mm-hmm. um, my interest in technology was uh, was there. Um, and there was a gap between leaving the army in the June and joining. Uh, it was actually Mercury Asset Management, uh, which is part of Warburgs, um, in the uh, in the September. And I thought, well, who knows? about technology what you know who, yep. who, who knows about technology more than technology companies do and i worked out it was headhunters because headhunters are like priests were 200 years ago they know about what's happening before it actually happens <laughs> and uh and so i um uh, uh the, i was living in winter so um uh went and had an interview with this guy called roger baker right. um and uh he offered me a job as a part-time researcher and um it just opened my eyes because our clients at that time were organizations like, you know, KPMG and Perot Systems. Mm. Uh, and Perot Systems had just done a really big deal with East Midlands Electricity and used outsourcing, mm. uh, IT outsourcing, uh, as the enabler to transform the business. I thought, hey, this is the future. So um, I, uh, I then it was set the, up It was own... the, economic, the economics of that that was eye-opening? It was. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I can t- talk about the deal until. I mean, it's it's one of the best deals I've ever come across. So, mm-hmm. uh, Perot uh, went into EME, East Midlands Electricity. This was a time when, when the um, the twelve regional electricity companies uh, were created. Yep. It's now down to four, I think. Yeah. Uh, there were twelve originally. East Midlands Electricity was right at the bottom of the uh, of the shareholder value, mm-hmm. mainly because their IT was completely shot. Okay. So, uh, Pro Systems came in and said, "Okay, we'll run the IT for you." Mm. But we, the headhunters, Roger Baker and partners, and, and, and I was helping, were actually finding business process re-engineering consultants, BPR guys and girls, um, mm. uh, if, you, if anyone remembers those, mm. because they were transforming the business using IT as the enabler for that. And it's the first time I'd actually seen that happen. 
And three mm -hmm. things happened. Firstly, EME went from 12th to 6th in terms of shareholder value out of the 12. Um, second thing was that Perot doubled the size of the deal from 300 to 600 million dollars, wow. um, which was quite substantial. And the third thing was using that as the use case, as the case study, they then won California Light and Power, which was 1.2 billion dollars, which back in the 90s was a huge amount of money. For sure, it was yeah. a massive deal. So I thought anything that could make that much difference to you know the service provider pro to the uh, to the organization um, and to the people involved has got to be good news. So I got involved then got involved with um, with uh, with outsourcing after doing uh, running a, um, a research company and uh, and then got into outsourcing and um, worked for a, a company called Equiterra, um, which was um, one of the like TPI it became ISG. Um, were the sort of outsourcing advisory organizations helping companies to decide how they're going to um, mm. offshore of these work. Yeah, sure. And uh, and then got into outsourcing, worked for several outsourcing companies, ended up at a company called Sutherland Global Services. And um, can I just um, just jump in for one second? Oh, sorry. I'm, guess, I'm guessing in these roles, am I right in thinking that you were a salesperson? That was your role? That, that's uh, the you know, top tip from Guy. Yeah. And if you're if you're not actively selling, don't join the sales organization. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it really is that simple. Um, yeah. Mainly because if you join a sales organization, I mean, what I really did was demand generation. But mm -hmm. if you join a sales organization and the sales management changes, the first thing the new sales director does when he comes into the business, he goes down the list and says, right, you know, these are all my people. These are the stars. These are the average people. And there's this one chap right at the bottom who never sold anything. Who's he? That's Guy Kirkwood. Oh, well, he's <laughs> Every time. Okay. So, uh, so if you're doing demand generation, join marketing. That's mm -hmm. the top tip. Um, so anyway, uh, I, was, um, I was working with Sutherland, and um, we had a technology business. Um, it was Dell, actually. Um, and we were going to outsource all of their order processing. Mm -hmm. uh, because the order processing system was 20 years old um, and it was embedded in everything that the organization did. So they tried to change it six times, but every time they tried to change it, something fell over. Um, so that they literally had a thousand people manually doing the silver chair processing, cutting and pasting and rekeying stuff into the, into the system. Um, green screen, great. Um, and, uh, and we said, so we said, we did the usual business process outsourcing BPOE stuff and saying, okay, so what we'll do is we'll come in, we'll take all the people on, we'll consolidate into a shared service operation, we'll move that shared service operation offshore, so you get a better service for less money, um, you know, shall we crack on? Mm -hmm. uh, and they said, yeah, great idea. It, we've already done all of that. We've already done Lean Six Sigma. We've already done, you know, consolidating the shared service operation. 96% of those people are offshore. Anyway, uh, so how can you help? Um, not sure. So anyway, the team went back and we realized that the only way that we could actually make any money on this deal was um, to automate. Right. And um, so uh, we went to see um, a little business called Blue Prism uh, in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and then we went to see uh, this even smaller organization, um, which consisted of seven people in a flat uh, an apartment in Bucharest uh, called Deskover, uh, run by uh, two people. One is called Daniel Dinez, and the other one is uh, Marius Tirka. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and we used what became UiPath technology. We were the first customer of what became Right, UiPath. okay. Um, and the results were staggering. Uh, I won't bother to get into them now, but it, it was so impressive. I had that, if you think about that, the, in the back, you know, that Ross Perot moment, the, the Perot Systems moment, where I was thinking, ah, oh, outsourcing, this is the future. I had exactly the same feeling when, mm -hmm. uh, when I found out about this automation stuff. It was um, the solution for this problem. It, it, it was. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, normally when you think about technology, technology is a, is a solution to search for a problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, a new piece of technology comes out and you go, great, whiz bang, so what? You know, yeah. how is that going to help us? But right from the off, you could see that the automation was going to have a fundamental impact on, on organizations, even, mm -hmm. even back in the, you know, back 2013, 2014, when we were doing that deal. 
So I started talking about this and, and writing about it and, and so on. And, um, uh, and then Daniel and uh, got his seed round uh, funding, um, raised just under a million dollars, uh, at a valuation of $8 million. And, um, uh, and one of the first, you know, he hired some people, uh, of which I was one of them. And, um, and that was, was uh, that Seed Camp who did the Seed Round? And Early Bird? Yeah. I think it was Seed Camp and Early Bird. Early Bird, right? early bird and Seed Camp, yeah. yeah. So it's Early Bird. Um, early Bird is, uh, is uh, for those who don't know, is um, by far the best, most intelligent um, early round um, investor in Europe, without a shadow of a doubt. They, uh, I think they've got three or four unicorns now uh, wow. from those organizations that they've identified really early on. Yeah. Um, they are brilliant. Um, anyway, um, so so Early Bird and Seed Camp uh, and, uh, and I joined originally as uh, Chief Operating Officer, COO, uh, and then switched to the, uh, the uh, Chief Evangelist role after about six, seven months, I suppose. Uh, and I've been happily doing what I do since. Cool. So there and that was going to take about <clears throat> two minutes to answer that question, but it turned into 15 minutes. No, I think it's good. I think, I think also, I think, you know, for anyone um, who's interested, you know, during your career, I'm guessing, you know, you, you made this kind of jump from, you know, you, as you said at the beginning in your introduction, like you're now a storyteller. I think you kind of, when we we'd spoke before the show, you know, in the prep notes, I think, you know, what was really interesting for me is that you, you'd realized that what you did, what your skill set was, was demand generation. And you realized that the, the best output for that skill set was in this kind of, uh, this evangelist role, which really sits within marketing, not within sales, where you kind of been traditionally your whole career, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it wasn't my idea to become chief evangelist. It was Daniel's, actually. But, um, mm -hmm. but he was right. And, and I've grown into that role. Um, yeah. you know, the, the, there are four tenets uh, that, that UiPath has um, that is, comes from top to bottom. So that's, uh, that's be bold, mm -hmm. be fast, be immersed, and be humble. And actually, the humility thing is the most important. Because if, you, if you're not humble, you mm -hmm. fight your corner. You don't mm -hmm. listen you defend yourself and so therefore you can't change and uh, and so that that humility that's throughout throughout our organization is probably the most the, the thing that really makes us stand out as a company culturally as opposed to from a technology standpoint that's uh, that's really uh, that's interesting um especially when you're you know in a competitive market i think having humility is is a good thing because it allows you to you know, interact with the market, which is very competitive, but also still, def you know, I wouldn't say defend, but, you know, be kind of proud of your position in it, whilst also respecting that, as you said at the beginning, you know, even other people kind of created the RPA acronym, but you guys, you know, have kind of co-opted it as well as part of this, this broader market now. Um, Guy, what would you say gives you most satisfaction in your job? Um, well, after talking about humility, what mm -hmm. really gives me the most satisfaction is making sure that we do well in the analyst reports. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Reason for that is that you know, the the if I said that the headhunters used to be um, you know the priests of two hundred years ago, <laughs> that role in our market certainly is taken by the analysts. Yeah. Um, because they're talking to everybody they're talking to uh the companies that support us from a from an implementation perspective they talk to mm. organizations like yours from a from a technology perspective they, they talk to customers of course um and uh, and they get inquiries from uh, and now investment community as well um, yeah. they're getting questions all the time and the the inquiry calls that they get they're called inquiry calls or inquiry if you're american um and um the um those calls is where they're being asked for their advice and the key role for and the thing that gives me most satisfaction is when i find out that they are talking about us when we're not in the room so i spend a lot of time at the moment talking to um, venture capital organizations uh private yep. organizations and the, and the portfolio companies Mm -hmm. that are in them, including Seacamp and, uh, and, and Early Bird and so on. Um, and, I, and I always say the same thing, and you've been in those conversations. Um, 
the the relationship you build up with the analysts is probably the most important one that you can do initially. Yeah. Yeah. Now, most organizations don't get that. They don't, they, they, they think about the analysts as an afterthought or we need to brief the analysts, but, but actually the relationship with the analyst needs to start really from day zero mm -hmm. when you're in a startup because the better the relationship you've got and the more trusting, this is where the humility comes in, the, the more trusting that relationship is, the better that you are perceived as an organization by the people who are talking about the market as a whole. So it took us about six months to go from nowhere to being in the leader quadrant, or sorry, no, not the leader quadrant, in, in, uh, to be on the, the first um, Forrester wave. Mm -hmm. RPA, um, which is unheard of. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that we did anything right, but the lessons that we learned from that is that even if you're a smaller organization, a startup organization, and this is a, a really good, serious tip for, for your listeners uh, and viewers, is you want to get on the, onto those Gartner Magic Quadrants, the Forrester Waves, the Everest Peaks, and so on. Why? Because if you can get into the top three, as we did very early on, then you have full sight of the market. Because people, organizations tend to look at those things and go, OK, so who are the top three? We'll send our request for proposal or our request for information to those people, start mm -hmm. with. And then we can look at others. But they always start with the top three. So if you can get there in your small nascent category, whatever that might be, mm -hmm. that is immensely powerful. So yeah. the thing that gives me most pleasure um, uh, and the thing that, that I measure myself on is how well our relationships are going with the analyst community. And that's yeah. not just with the people that are focused on RPA, but it cuts across you know, pretty much any topic that you can think <clears throat> of because, yeah. you know, that by, might be by geography or by industry because RPA is applicable to, you know, luckily applicable to all of them. Yeah. No, I mean, um, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting seeing, you know, how effective your analyst relations um, strategy has been. And I think, you know, quick shout out to you. I think you've, you know, gave me a lot of support in uh, kickstarting our analyst relations um, kind of journey. And, you know, we've built some really great relationships with the likes of um, IDC and Forrester recently. So um, that's been really, really great to hear from you. Well, and also, just... anyone that's listening uh, who, who really wants to understand this, there is one mm -hmm. person they need to talk to, and that's Sven Litka. That's uh, Sven, S-V-E-N, Litka, L-I-T-K-E. Um, he's been working with us as long as I have uh, with UiPath. Yeah. He runs a company called Kia Company, uh, and mm -hmm. they are they specialize in analyst relations, and they are brilliant. So uh, I mean, if anyone wants to get in touch with either of us, actually, then, yeah. uh, then uh, we can pass on uh, pass on the details. But Sven and his team are, are fantastic. And, and just on that subject, actually, of like help and support, um, just thinking, you know, in the kind of story you told us, I think it's a it's an interesting story from like, you know, the Scots Guards to being at the beginning of like the outsourcing market to, you know, the RPA kind of genesis, which is really, I think, a natural kind of, you know, uh, disruptor of that kind of whole outsourcing process. I mean, in that, in that kind of timeline, have you had any mentors that have helped you, who you've kind of looked up to or have kind of gave you a bit of kind of mentorship and steer to, to help you grow? Who, who, who would they be? Tell us a story about any of those guys. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean Daniel, obviously, um, mm -hmm. uh, has, you know, he, he, he made me what I am today um, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the chief evangelist role. But prior to that, actually, it was a guy uh, I worked with, um, a headhunter, um, not Roger Baker, funnily enough, but this, this, was, this is a guy, uh, I worked for a company called Borderless Executive Search, uh, based mm -hmm. in Brussels. And uh, his name is Andrew Chris, that's K-R-I-S. And he still runs Borderless with his wife. Um, and the, he, was, he was a true mentor because he had confidence that although I was really bad at sales, um, um, I was quite good at building relationships. Yeah. So um, he basically fed me for you know two years while I sort of got my act together. Um, and um, the reason that he was a mentor was because, and the link to what I've done previously and afterwards, mm -hmm. is that he was prior to going into headhunting was um, uh, one of the very senior guys at Johnson & Johnson in right. the organization. And 
um, he decided that he wasn't going to do what was politically expedient to get to the top of the slippery pole, um, but didn't want to leave the organization. So inevitably, they gave him all the shit jobs to do. Um, so he had to go and run finance and procurement and HR. And yeah. you know, as a, as a business person who was used to building business, he thought, oh God, what am I going to do with this? But the only thing he knew how to do was build business. Right. So he did that. He turned those operations into what we now know as shared service operations or global business services. Uh, very interesting, yeah. And actually wrote the book on it. It's called Mining for Corporate Gold. It's quite old now, but it's just brilliant. It's cool. Um, and so that combination between, between people, process, and technology was writ large by Andrew. And, and he, was, he, was, he is wonderful with people. He, he, uh, you know, he was humble as well. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize it then, but I do now. <laughs> um, so, and, and the great thing was that he encouraged us to think beyond what we would normally do. In fact, right. so much so that uh, my children were five and seven um, at that time, and um, uh, we were going to go through the whole sort of British, you know, prep school and public school stuff. Uh, for people who don't understand the British system, public school is not public, but <laughs> that's by the by. Um, and um, and and so when we went to Christmas parties uh, at this this uh, borderless uh, in um, in Brussels. Because there were so many different nationalities there, the children were all switching languages between Italian and Flemish and French and English, and we thought this is amazing. So, uh, so we bought a little place in uh, in France, and um, we went over there and literally threw our children into French uh, school, okay. and um, they didn't speak a word of French. And uh, a year later, they were fluent without accent, and it's the best thing that we have done. Okay, from our perspective. And I guess you know, for anyone listening, um, you know. Um... UiPath is, uh, I think, it started off in Romania, but it's now based or headquartered in New York, but it's a global mm -hmm. business with, you know, thousands of employees and offices all over the world. Um, whereabouts are you based? I'm based, yeah, I'm currently at home. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, after moving back from France, uh, I've got headhunted back. Um, then um, we now live in Devon or the Devon Cornwall border. Um, there's a... Um, uh, the river that, that separates um, Devon and Cornwall is called the Tamar. Uh, okay. And we live in the Tamar Valley, just at the top of the Tamar Valley on the Devon side. Um, very close to um, a um, World Heritage Site, uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is known as the Devon Great Consuls. So um, I think about 75% of the world's copper came out of those mines in the 18th century. Um, oh, wow. So uh, an amazing place. To and live. I always... I always knew you as a larger than life character. And then you told me about the animals that you keep. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I was kind of staggered. So I thought it was a good story to kind of bring into the conversation. You have quite an interesting set of pets, let's call them, all well, rather yeah, large. We, we, we sort of collect them. Um, so, uh, <laughs> we have, uh, we currently have three Great Danes uh, and a Norfolk Terrier. Guess who's in Interest charge. Interesting mix. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I guess who's in charge. Um, <laughs> inevitably the Terrier. Um, mm -hmm. And then we have uh, seven horses, and uh, uh, I uh, and our entire family ride. Um, so uh, my wife and children do dressage, uh, and I do. Um, I try and stay on. Uh, I don't do dressage. I'm not good enough. I stay on a horse. Uh, that's about it. I'm a, I'm a, I make a good passenger. So um, I think it's a really interesting. Uh you know, pastoral image, you know, real kind of British countryside, you know, behind this uh, rocket ship technology business. So I think that's a really cool story um, for everyone. And thank you for sharing that. Well, it's, um, you know, it's, it, I've been, I mean, you know, we've been extremely lucky during lockdown that I can go out and walk the dogs and ride the horses and so on. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I really, we've got friends at university, we were at university with, who, are having a really hard time, I mean, psychologically, mental mm. health hard time, mm -hmm. because they're stuck in flats and they can't get out. And um, so you, you can be fun and facetious all you like, but it really does matter to people. And yeah. Actually, you know, Forrester have said that there are now 18 million more people working from home this year than there were last year, and that's just in the US alone. So you know, we've got to make sure that we, we look after people. 
It's interesting. So well, actually, you know, to a question I want to ask you before when we were talking about, you know, like the rise and the success, I think obviously it's always great to hear, you know, the positive side of things and how people have made it. But I think it's always true to say that, you know, with success comes some kind of, you know, hurdles on the way or some kind of, you know, um, some lessons. What would you say has been for you, you know, one of your kind of biggest lessons or perhaps even your biggest failures in your in your career to date? I think um, that's always a really interesting kind of perspective to get from Yeah, I, I think we sort of covered it. You know, it's mm. um, the fact that I've been fired or made redundant from every job I've ever had. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure that's a negative in a lot of ways. Funnily enough, it's that, you know, eventually I, I got so blasé about it. Oh, I'm being made redundant. Oh, okay, how much? Um, you know, <laughs> that was... That was you know, so for some people, it, when they first get made redundant, they're going, oh, no, this is the end of the world. But, um, but no, I think, I think that's it. You know, it's, it's finding your place. Mm -hmm. And I know that's hard in a lot of cases, but it's taken me a long time. You know, I look at the, the people in, in UiPath, and I'm really old. I'm 54 years old. The majority of people are half my age in the business. <laughs> um, and, you know, to join a rocket ship, there was the guy who used to run, um, run uh, or created Google, uh, 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 I think it was Larry Page. Um, he said, you know, when, when I offer you a job, you're joining a rocket ship. He said, don't ask me which seat you're going to get, just get on the rocket. And it has been that with, with UI path, mm -hmm. uh, and be that through luck or good judgment, or you know, it's it's a combination of all those things, of course. But I look at the young people coming into work now, not just in UI path, but you know, work generally into the world of work. Yeah, and it, it is it's hard. You know, it, it doesn't matter which country you live in, mm. the politics of of my generation. Um, are, are making it really hard for for the younger generation. You know, the, you keep seeing things. Um, Scott Galloway, you know, professor at uh, yeah. New York, uh, writes articles about this. Uh, I yeah. heartily recommend them, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, about the fact that the, this next generation are are earning have earning potential less than their parents. That's the first time that's ever happened. Yeah. So you know if the world of work is going to change it's up to us the vendors it's up to us collectively as the ecosystem that supports the world of work to mm. make sure that people aren't left behind um, i really fundamentally think that that's why we're doing a lot of work with with the world economic forum and eu and, and the un and so on because because it's we've, we've got to make sure that if we become a generational business that mm -hmm. we are supporting the generations to come mm -hmm. rather than us now. And, and that's really important. And there's a lady that's doing fantastic pieces, really, well, fantastic work on this is, is one of my colleagues, uh, is Margaret Chassari. Um, and uh, it, the work that she's doing is just amazing. Yeah, I thought, I think, you know, it's interesting, you know, um, one of the things that I think, you know, UiPath were very effective at, at the beginning was um, opening up the software, the platform to this much broader community. You were like one of the first movers on the UiPath Academy. Um, you kind of have no created. Idea, okay, okay, so that's one uh, and, shout yeah, out for guys. You talking about things I'm proud of? Yeah, that's probably one of them. Okay. Um, so it, when I when I joined, um, we were all all of the vendors were charging for training. Yeah, because frankly, we weren't making a huge amount of money out of licenses. Um, so, but but I said no, you've got to give it away. You've got you've got to. We did, we, we, I didn't use the word democratize, but you've got to make sure that as many people get your hands on your software as, as, as we can. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was the idea, because I've done some MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, mm -hmm. uh, and seen how successful they could be. Um, and funnily enough, they weren't successful because they extend and expand the people who are using it. It's because it expands the people who come up with the good ideas, you know, we're a right. small, we're still a small business. Mm -hmm. We've got sort of nearly 3,000 people, but we're still a small business. Um, and we, we, we do not have a monopoly on good ideas. In fact, quite the reverse. It's our community that come mm. up with the good ideas. 
So if you can democratize and give away as much as you can uh, and still, still remain commercially viable, that is always got to be beneficial because it's someone in Kazakhstan or Bangalore or Bristol that comes up, and goes, oh, I was trying out your software and I've got a really good idea about doing this. Ah. Um, and that, you know, that, that is so powerful. So the mm -hmm. UiPath Academy has now trained, I think, 750,000 people around the world. That's astonishing. That is crazy. Yeah. And they're all kind of trained RPA developers for like a, a new type yeah. of kind of role in the economy, really. Yeah, but it's, it, well, it, it goes broader than that because uh, we, we then um, set up the Academic Alliance. So mm -hmm. um, you know, in the same way that Google and Apple uh, and, and Microsoft give laptops to schools mm -hmm. and universities, so that you get used to using, you know, the, the, that platform. <coughs> um, we did the same with, with the Academic Alliance. So um, we went to the universities and said, uh, if RPA, if automation, broad automation, uh, is going to have fundamental impact on work, regardless of the degree that you're doing, that your students are doing, you yeah. need to teach RPA. Mm -hmm. um, and we expected a really slow uptake. Um, but we now have, and this is since April, May 2019, we've got over 800 universities around the world that are now teaching wow. RPA level their curriculum. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, on the subject of community, just bring it back to kind of, I guess, a reinfer slant for a second. Mm -hmm. Obviously, for any of our listeners, it's uh, no surprise that we're a natural language processing um, platform. We specialize in what we call communications mining. And, um, you know, we're partnered obviously with UiPath. What do you think the, the kind of future holds for this ecosystem guy um, of both kind of automation tools and more cognitive tools like ourselves and, and like other businesses? Where do you think it's going, you know, in the future? Where do you think this, uh, this automation market um, is kind of, um, is evolving to? Yeah. I mean, I, uh... I, um, I got famous uh, a couple of years ago for saying that AI is bollocks. Um, <laughs> and, uh, because, you know, most organizations, that the, the C-suites of the companies, they, they say, oh, we need AI. AI is definitely the way forward. We need AI without having any clue that AI is actually, as you said, is a combination of different tools. Um, mm -hmm. It's an ecosystem. It's not a, it's not a thing. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, uh, and I've said this before, um, but I think all of these technologies will disappear. Okay. Uh, and they're not going to disappear because they're not going to get used. They're going to disappear because they've just become the fabric of what we do. You know, Embedded. Um, electricity. No one cares unless you're an eco-mentalist. Um, you know, when you switch the light on, the, the light comes on. Where's the electricity coming from? How's it generated? What's the, you know, all of that just becomes part of the fabric of everyday life. And, and that's exactly what will happen with these technologies. Um, that's RPA and um, what we term as the four understanding. So, you know, visual understanding, computer vision type stuff, product as uh, so a document understanding, sort of, um, uh, sort of OCR and uh, intelligent OCR and sentiment analysis and all the rest of that stuff, process understanding. So mm -hmm. understanding what processes, uh, how they work and what's, who's doing what, and your work, which is conversational understanding. And mm -hmm. all of those things are going to come together. Mm. Uh, and so we've got, we've got all people coming into RPA from different directions. So you've got us as the sort of core, core RPA vendors. Uh, then you've got the, uh, the API driven organizations, um, the BPM organizations, the, CR, the, the CRM and ERP type companies that, that want to automate as much as they can. They're all sort of coming into this space. So we're expanding mm -hmm. out, they're expanding in. Yeah. So I think that there is going to be a, uh, and I've said this before, you know, consolidation in the market um, as the, the more challenger <coughs> type organization uh, in the RPA, pure RPA space. Yeah. So it's got acquired, um, and uh, and the, the competitive landscape will change over time. So now we've you know we've got Microsoft coming to the market. We've got SAP making lots of acquisitions in this, in this market. Yeah. Um, but I'm expecting organisations like Google and Amazon and Salesforce to to move in over the mm -hmm. over the, the next few months and and possibly a couple of years, um, as as more and more 
mundane work is where we started uh, mm -hmm. becomes automated and they, they, you know it's, it just makes sense for well, people to innovate I think themselves. I think it's interesting you say that about mundane work I think you know um, I think a lot of uh, kind of um, observers of the automation market over the past few years kind of have, have viewed um, uh, you know the kind of the innovations around really kind of clerical back office work but I think now what we're seeing is you know it, it's that the stage is set for the disruption of knowledge worker activity you know right. in our in our world where we play when we sit a lot i guess further upstream to the genesis of a kind of a, of a process and i think now that's really the battleground for for disruption because the way professional services um have kind of functioned you know via email via calls via you know these kind of really kind of I would call them human centric processes that's now opening itself up to, to disruption because of all of those four pillars of, of, I think, sensory perception that these, these systems, these tools can have. And, you know, when you get that, that symbiosis between, I guess, man and machine, you've got, you know, a totally not just embedded infrastructure where things are imperceptible, but it's also a perceptual infrastructure where it's constantly listening and, and learning and, and judging and rooting, you know, it's, I think it's really, you know, the next, I think what we've seen so far is just the start. I think the next few years are going to be really fascinating for that. I, I, I absolutely agree. And when I talk about the boring, mundane, repetitive stuff, it doesn't matter what your job is. Yeah. There are bits of your job that you don't want to do. And there's, mm -hmm. uh, Forrester did a big study on this, uh, run by a guy called David Johnson, uh, David Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, who's one of their lead analysts on employee engagement. And it turns out that the, the key indicator for employee engagement isn't, how much someone is paid or you know how much recognition they get or whatever it turns out that actually the key indicator for employee engagement is whether you as an individual think that the work you are doing takes the business forward is important um, and where you see very large churn of people that is obviously not the case that yes. they are not doing stuff that they feel is important therefore you know, you have a, a large turnover of, of staff. Yeah. Um, so automation helps regardless of whether you are a, a lawyer, a doctor, a, you know, a scientist, a, um, a technician, uh, an engineer, um, mm -hmm. a teacher, you know, a student. It, it cuts across so much of, of our world now. And, mm -hmm. you know, I come back to where we started, which is, you know, automation what you do what we do what the ecosystem does is reshaping that mm -hmm. and just on you know in terms of that kind of that that landscape there you know of, of different kind of people and um and places are there any um specific industries or kind of um verticals that are most kind of intriguing or most fascinating to you where UiPath's kind of innovating at the moment um most if you look at the if you look at the adoption of, of RPA, it's, uh, it tends to start in finance. Uh, so mm -hmm. BFSI, Bank of Financial Services Insurance, mm -hmm. uh, manufacturing. Um, but where we're really seeing uh, a, a massive uptake um, in the last year, mainly because of COVID, is public sector. Okay, interesting. So, uh, public sector is, is, is a very exciting place to be working at the moment. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, Guy, I think, you know, um, that's been really, really interesting. I think, you know, really, uh, really kind of interesting perspectives on you, on UiPath. Um, I guess just to kind of wrap it up, you know, what, what does the future hold for, for Guy Kirkwood? Obviously, we can't go into too much detail about UiPath with, you know, potential IPOs pending, et cetera. But I'm more interested in perhaps you. What, what does the future hold for you in a few years down the line? What, what would you get up to pending any kind of, um, you know, evolution in this space? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, I, I I love the job that I do, um, and um, you know, if I was going to if I was going to find something else to do, it would be something completely different. I think. Okay. Uh, so um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. But then, over the last thirty years that I've been in business, I've never known the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's a, a happy-go-lucky, I suppose. Um, so let's see, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And in terms of, you know, for anyone, you know, like ourselves, like young kind of startups looking to emulate, you know, what UiPath have done and, 
kind of learn from from people like yourself and businesses like like UiPath. Any advice you'd give to to any startups that are kind of embarking on the enterprise software space or in any kind of technology space? What, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's a relatively simple process, um, but it requires nothing more than hard work, mm-hmm. um, and that is to understand as broad broadly as you can the the milieu in which you operate and i'm not talking about industry i'm not talking about sector i'm not talking about category um i'm talking just generally you know just picking up newspapers and magazines and um you know not that anyone sits on planes reading reading those in the flight magazines but you know you, it ideas can be triggered off by anything mm-hmm. and and so it's read broadly um, find people you can trust uh, and that could be your investors that could be the uh, analyst community which I mentioned um, it could be mentors which we've discussed as well yeah. um, then then you know don't think you can do everything yourself find out what you're good at as an as an individual find out what you're good at yeah. And then just practice it. Um, you know, when when I was very young, I, mean, I was terrified of speaking in front of people and um, uh, and couldn't do it very well. Yeah. And then I did, you know, drama training and all the rest of it. I was really bad at acting, but um, I was really good at mine. There you go. That tells you something. <laughs> um, but really bad at acting. But uh, but the more you do it, the the easier it becomes. And it's uh, so it's just practice. So read broadly, get some friends, practice what you're good at. That's great. That's great advice. And um, for anyone who wants to kind of reach out to you, Guy, to follow you, to interact with you, what's the best way to do that? LinkedIn. Uh, I am on Twitter, but I'm thinking about binning it because it's just monster. <laughs> I'm not going to go there now. But uh, um, yeah. so LinkedIn is, is good. Um, and uh, so I think I'm the only Guy Kirkwood, so it's fairly easy to find. Um, uh, and or email me, you know, um, we are very open. So my email address is guy at uipath.com. Awesome. Well, Guy, thank you so much for being uh, our AI pioneer, uh, you know, in this, in this interview. Um, real pleasure to, you know, got to know you over the past few years. Grateful for all your help and support and uh, very excited to see, you know, what happens in the near future. Fantastic. Well, Stephen, thank you very, very much indeed for having me. Thanks, Guy.